Meeting will please come to order. Today's hearing on the 2009 pandemic H1N1 flu is a continuation of this committee's ongoing interest in learning more about and staying on top of this developing and concerning situation. The hearing builds on the work of Chairman Pallone's Health Subcommittee, which held an initial hearing on the issue earlier this year. From then until now, one thing has become crystal clear, even as events continue to evolve. As a nation, we must be prepared for whatever the H1N1 virus brings in its path, to fight it as best we can, and to ensure adequate and appropriate resources to treat those who fall seriously ill. We are especially pleased to have as our witness today the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Secretary Sebelius will share with us the government's plan for addressing this enormous challenge. When the Health Subcommittee first met six months ago, there was much we did not know about H1N1 virus. We didn't know how dangerous the virus was. We didn't know if there would be a vaccine available. We didn't even know if the virus would return in the fall. Many of those questions have now been answered. We know this outbreak won't be the false alarm of 1976 when the surge of swine flu cases never materialized. Indeed, we are already seeing a large increase in cases, a pattern that is likely to continue. The epidemic will undoubtedly lead to hospitalizations. Schools may close. Healthcare facilities may become overwhelmed. And almost certainly, there will be some who will die. But there's also good news. This administration has carried on the efforts begun several years ago to prepare the country for the very situation we must now tackle. The plans developed appear to be unfolding appropriately. And experts tell us that so far, the 2009 H1N1 epidemic will not be anything like that which occurred in 1918 when an unusually dangerous flu virus devastated our nation. More good news was reported just last week. We not only will have an effective vaccine in place, studies now indicate that the vaccine will probably require only a single dose rather than the two doses many had predicted. As a result, I hope Secretary Sebelius will report today uh, that across the country we'll have a good supply of vaccine, allowing us to avoid both the additional cost and the additional needle stick that a second dose would mean. I expect that we will hear more about this as well as other H1N1 flu activities from Secretary Sebelius. I know all of us are also particularly interested in getting the Secretary's perspective on not only the progress we are making in taking on this virus, but also the difficulties we surely will face along the way. But as we make preparations and carry out detailed plans for dealing with this new virus, we must, must also take heed of the battle we confront annually against the seasonal flu. Each and every year, some 36,000 Americans, mostly among the elderly, die from this preventable disease. We can and should, should do much better than that. And I hope that Secretary Sebelius can also share with us the administration's thinking on addressing this concern, and in particular, how that approach relates to its H1N1 strategy. Uh, with that, on behalf of the entire committee, I want to thank the Secretary for appearing before us today. Uh, we all look forward to hearing from you and to learning more about the H1N1 challenges that lies ahead. But before the Secretary will be recognized to make her statement, I want to call on several of the members of the committee to make opening statements. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing on the uh, examination of our nation's preparedness for the H1N1 flu uh, virus as we approach the flu season. And I look forward to uh, Secretary Sebelius's testimony and welcome her to the hearing today. As I mentioned during the subcommittee hearing last April, the threat of a global influenza pandemic is one of the greatest public health threats that we face today. From speaking to scientists, researchers, health care providers, and other experts in the field, I truly believe that it's not a matter of if a flu pandemic hits, but when. And I believe we have the responsibility to ensure the greatest public protection possible uh, when the situation arises. We all recognize that that's not a simple matter.
Since the first reports of this novel strain of the influenza virus began to surface earlier this year, U.S. and international authorities have taken aggressive steps to mitigate the spread of the illness. This has taken the dedication and cooperation of all of those involved, both public and private sectors, particularly as the infection rates have increased. Uh, as my home state of Georgia and other areas in the South have witnessed the easily transmittable H1N1 strain as it continues to spread, particularly as we have now begun school uh, somewhat earlier than other parts of the country, uh, we all recognize that this is a, a real threat. Uh, I have been in contact with my state's agencies and uh, they are also coordinating, of course, with your offices at the federal level and also as you are coordinating with international groups uh, during these months that will lie ahead as we try to deal with this problem. The current response to the H1N1 strain was coordinated in large part with plans which were developed to respond to a similar situation, the H5N1 avian flu. In 2006, Congress provided approximately $6 billion for pandemic planning and cross-agency collaboration. These earlier efforts and others focused on preparedness for emergencies have streamlined the response to this situation. While our efforts to combat H1N1 have been aggressive, we must continue to monitor the situation closely and be proactive as we hopefully will be able to avoid this but uh, regrettably know that it will probably increase in severity. Again, thank you, Secretary Sebelius, for being with us today. I look forward to your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here today to give us an update on the H1N1 situation. When the virus first hit, it was devastating. It caused sickness, it generated fear, it caused panic, and it caused many deaths, and there were many unknowns about the virus. We did not know how the disease would present itself over time, how well it would respond to the antiviral viral medications on the market today, or how quickly it would develop resistance to those drugs, and we didn't know if, uh, if and how quickly we would be able to develop and manufacture a vaccine. While we've learned more about the virus and we've made progress on a vaccine, it has spread worldwide across continents and hemispheres. And now as a level six pandemic, the highest warning level there is, it has continued to spread in the U.S. during the summer months, which is unusual for an influenza. And that adds to the unknowns and reinforces the fact that we still have to take it seriously. In my state alone, 17 people have died since the beginning of the outbreak and over 570 have been hospitalized and we've yet to see the disease at its strongest. In addition, the peak of this flu coincides with the normal flu season, which on its own can be extremely taxing on the healthcare delivery system. I'm curious to hear how the federal government is tackling the fact that this flu tends to affect individuals under 50 years of age, unlike the seasonal flu that hits the elderly the hardest. The younger population does not deal with disease often and tends to not seek medical care as readily. There have been many questions about our nation's ability to respond to medical emergencies. Unfortunately, it's hard to justify spending money on programs that are in place in case something bad happens, especially since so many programs that are needed on a daily basis have been chronically underfunded. But as history has taught us, grand-scale disease outbreaks can be devastating. At a time when our economy is just be beginning to mend and the number of uninsured is rising, we must now more than ever be prepared for such a situation and we don't want to add to the health, health insurance crisis and we certainly don't want to hinder the economic recovery. So I just want to commend you and your team, Secretary, for the excellent work you've done on this issue. During the first wave of the virus, I know you and your staff were working around the clock to provide tests and test results to states, to develop a vaccine, to educate state and local governments and keep the public informed of the latest information on the virus and how best to protect themselves from becoming sick. And so I want to thank you for that and look forward to hearing more today about how the federal government is prepared for this next wave of H1N1. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. I uh, want to say that this is a very important issue. Uh, obviously, America and the world is worried about the pandemic flu. Uh, we have begun to discuss this uh, uh, this year, back in April, when we had a hearing on the H1N1 virus. Uh, I'd like to review some of the recent history. The Department of HHS has responded by declaring a public health emergency, which has allowed the Food and Drug Administration to approve the use of approved antivirals and other measures. Uh, 
The Centers for Disease Control has responded by releasing antiviral drugs from the strategic national stockpile. To date, all 50 states have received their portion of that stockpile, which has been replenished through purchases. HHS is working with the Department of Homeland Security and is coordinating response efforts. Much of this work has been successful because we aren't breaking new ground. This committee and the federal government has begun serious work back in 2004, so in 2009, while we're not totally prepared, we are better prepared than we ever have been. There's still some issues that should be addressed, as outlined in the President's Advisory Council on Science and Technology. It's my understanding that the administration is actively working to address these concerns, and I look forward to hearing from you, Madam Secretary, on those issues. Um, I guess that is it, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, I have another part of my statement, but it's on the overall health care reform, and I understand that you limited your statement to the uh, pandemic flu. So in the spirit of this hearing, I'm going to do that. Um, I want to take a point of personal privilege and say I appreciate all the good wishes that many of you have given me about my birthday. Uh, today is my 60th birthday, and I feel about... Um, <laughs> Uh, 30 didn't bother me, 40 didn't bother me, 50 didn't bother me, but 60 bothers me. Uh, but I am glad to be having it, and uh, I'm blessed to have a great family, great friends, uh, and I think to be on the greatest committee in the House of Representatives. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Uh, I, too, want to wish you a happy birthday until you don't, you don't look a day over 59. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dingle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman from Texas has spoiled my opening remarks. I, uh, it was my intention to congratulate him as a fine young man who has performed well in his responsibilities and to congratulate him on his 60th anniversary and hope that he reaches many more. Uh, I'm sure that I've, at least I am the first in this committee to have the privilege and the pleasure of doing that. So, Mr. Barton, uh, all of us on the committee do wish you a very, very happy birthday and many, many happy returns. Now, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this important hearing, and I want to welcome Secretary Sibelius and thank her for joining us this afternoon. Madam Secretary, you will recall that your father was a member, was a member of this committee, a very distinguished one, and uh, I'm sure that gives you good memories when you appear in this room. You have taken a proactive role in preparing our country for the upcoming H1N1 pandemic by implementing surveillance procedures to attract an outbreak, mitigation members to keep uh, measures to keep Americans healthy, a proper vaccination plan, and a communication strategy to disseminate Im information of importance. I want to commend you and look forward to hearing your update on the administration's progress in planning for a potential outbreak. Same time, I want to recall that on, on an earlier occasion, we made some fine mistakes in dealing with a, program, with a uh, health problem of this kind on a related virus, which led to some splendid costs and some fine earnings for the legal profession. And I want to tell you, Madam Secretary, I'm pleased that you've not fallen into any of the holes that your predecessors did on that one. In any event, um, we have held, as all know, a hearing earlier on H1N1 uh, when, when there were only the first few people who were infected with the virus. It appears that the spread of the influenza virus that we're discussing did not let up during the summer as some had hoped, and experts predict an increased number of cases in the upcoming months. As of September 5, 2009, my own state of Michigan has already seen 3,419 confirmed or probable cases of H1N1. Further 11 people, most with underlying health conditions, have died after contracting the virus. All 50 states have reported now that there are cases of the virus within their borders and, and nationwide about 600 persons have died and 9,000 have been hospitalized. These figures highlight the need for the Congress and the administration to work together to prepare for the months ahead. 
Preventing the spread of H1N1 will require collective action not only from federal, state, and local governments, but also from individuals as well. To address this, it is imperative that we prepare evidence-based programs for parents, children, and businesses, and also public health professionals on what to expect as the nation prepares for more flu cases than seen in the past few years. I want to applaud the administration and the federal government for stockpiling vaccines, masks, antiviral medications, ventilators, and other things necessary to address the potential upcoming problems. Influential is unpredictable, and we must indeed be prepared for a wide variety of surprises. Today, federal, state, and local office officers are planning and executing multimedia outreach campaigns to arm Americans with the information they need to best keep themselves health healthy or to address their problems once they become ill. This is imperative because while we wait for N1, N, H1N1 vaccine to become available, we must each play a part in slowing or reducing the spread of the virus with simple steps like hand washing and staying home when sick. Additionally, it's important for families and businesses to prepare their strategies for dealing with H1N1. I have created an H1N1 agenda for my own office and urge other businesses here and elsewhere to do the same. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee, and also with you, Madam Secretary, as we seek to mitigate the outbreak of H1N1. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dingle. Uh, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing on the pandemic flu preparedness. Secretary Sebelius, welcome to our committee, and I look forward to hearing your testimony on the Department of Health and Human Services' efforts to ensure federal, state, and local public health officials are ready to prevent or respond to the spread of the H1N1 flu. When the H1N1 outbreak began in late February, um, excuse me, late April, federal and state health officials acted quickly to deal with the outbreak. Among other things, antiviral drugs were released from the national stockpile and efforts were immediately undertaken to develop, manufacture, and test a vaccine. Congress provided an emergency appropriation of $1.9 billion for flu response. An additional $5.8 billion was authorized contingent upon a presidential request documenting the need for and the proposed use of the additional funds. I'm inter interested in learning how much of this money is actually going to public health agencies. In our communities, particularly rural districts like the one I represent, our local public health agencies, hospitals and clinics who shoulder the responsibility for responding to a public health crisis. It is vital they receive financial support from the federal government. H1N1 is unique fr from flu season. Unlike the seasonal flu, H1N1 affects a different population, in particular young people with children, younger adults and pregnant women. From all indications I've read, the vaccines for H1N1 will not be ready until mid-October. I'm looking forward to hearing from you on what types of infrastructure HHS and CDC will have in place to distribute the vaccines in a timely fashion to pregnant women, people who live with or care for young children, health care and emergency services personnel, persons between the ages of 6 months and 24 years of age, and people between 25 and 64 who are at a higher risk from the H1N1 because of chronic health disorders like asthma. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, this is an issue I'll continue to monitor following today's hearing. I look forward to your testimony and learning how well the federal government is co coordinating with state and particularly local officials. As a nation, we respond and hopefully preventing widespread H1N1 outbreak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stupak. Uh, by previous understanding with the minority, uh, we said that the only ones who would be recognized for opening statements would be the chairman, the ranking member, Mr. Dingell, and then the uh, uh, chair and the, and the ranking member of the health and the oversight subcommittees. But without objection, the record will be held open for any opening statements from any member that wishes to include them. Uh, I want to uh, do this, uh, uh, move on, because uh, Secretary Sub One second. Uh, Mr. Walden, are, are you ready for your opening statement? You know what, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, I'll submit it for the record because I don't want to take too much time away from the Secretary. I appreciate okay. uh, the opportunity to do that. I look forward to your comments on this, and I do hope you'll be able to come back at some point because I'm sure we have questions on the 
overarching health care bill. Um, but I would, I would just say that uh, the flu is something we're all concerned about. I have a son who's a sophomore at uh, Wake Forest University, which got swept pretty early on with the flu outbreak. Uh, he got it. I don't know if it was H1N1, and neither does he, but he's recovered, thankfully. But it's an issue all families are worried about, so I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So, uh, Madam Secretary, we're delighted to have you with us. Your full uh, testimony that's been submitted in advance will be made part of the record, and we want to recognize you for your uh, oral presentation to us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, There's a, a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's on and pull it I close it. to you. Green light's on. Okay. Good. Um, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Barton, Mr. Deal, Mr. Pallone, Chairman Emeritus Dingell, uh, Mr. Stupak, Mr. Walden. Uh, it's good to be back, members of the committee. It's um, very good to be back before the Energy and Commerce Committee, and I appreciate the opportunity to give you an update on uh, the public health challenges of the H1N1 influenza. Um, let me just start by saying the administration is taking these challenges very seriously. Um, in fact, the night I was sworn in on April 28th, I went immediately to the Situation Room because this virus was just um, breaking out. And uh, from day one, this has been very high on my radar screen. Uh, we're working in close partnership with virtually every part of the federal government but also with governors, mayors, tribal leaders, state and local health departments, emergency personnel, working with the medical community, the private sector, uh, to actively prepare for the virus outbreaks that may develop over the next few months and to have some mitigation strategies in place in the meantime. Um, since the initial outbreak of the 2009 influenza, um, not only has a worldwide pandemic uh, been declared, it's also uh, presented itself as the dominant flu strain in the southern hemisphere during the winter flu season. Uh, here in the U.S., we continue to see H1N1 flu activity uh, over the summer, which is unusual. And as a number of you have already noted, uh, it has increased now that the fall is underway. We're anticipating further increases in flu cases as seasonal flu begins circulating among us. We have provided, uh, Mr. Chairman, each of the members with a, um, an update that's at your seats with some more details on the current situation, including a situational update that's on, um, I think, the third page of your handout. Dr. Ann Shuckett from the Centers for Disease Control is uh, with me today. And uh, CDC gives us these situational updates on a, um, a daily basis, and we wanted you to have the, the newest information. Um, although evidence to date shows that the virus has fortunately not changed to become more deadly, what we know is influenza is unpredictable, and we need to monitor both the impact of the 2009 H1N1 and seasonal flu uh, throughout the next several months. The virus uh, is infecting more people than we typically see with seasonal flu, including children, younger adults, and pregnant women. And slowing the spread of the virus is a responsibility shared by all of us. Um, Chairman Emeritus Dingell already referenced there are some simple steps, hand washing, covering coughs and sneezes, and staying home when you're sick. Um, is our important steps. The government-wide website, www.flu.gov, does have comprehensive information about what to do to avoid getting the flu. And I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know we have communicated this to the offices, but on that website, flu.gov, are widgets if any members of Congress want to put a widget on your own website so that your constituents can monitor on a regular basis, see the latest CDC guidance, uh, get regular information. We would strongly encourage um, you to do that if I'm speaking in techno speak. Um, a 12-year-old can be hired easily and tell you what to do with a widget. Um, my recommendation, oh, I'm, I apologize, Ranking Member Barton, I should have started with a happy birthday. And you'll find the 60s will treat you well. You know, it's, it's a good place to be. Um, 
To date, the CDC has issued recommendations on how individuals, schools, child care settings, colleges and universities, large and small businesses can guard against the flu, as well as a recent guidance on the appropriate use of antiviral drugs. Again, all of those are on the website and can be downloaded and shared with constituency groups if you're going um, to have some meetings at home. Guidance on infection control and worker safety in healthcare settings is forthcoming in the next uh, few days. As I announced this weekend, we plan to initiate our H1N1 vaccination program in October. Mid-October is still the target for the large-scale campaign to get underway, but we anticipate having limited amounts of vaccine available a week or 10 days earlier. I'm pleased to report that today the Food and Drug Administration has approved applications for vaccines for the 2009 H1N1 virus from four of the manufacturers of the U.S. licensed seasonal influenza vaccines. The vaccines for this virus are being produced under careful FDA oversight using the same licensed manufacturing processes and facilities used for seasonal flu vaccines that are provided every year to protect millions against the flu. And in response, Mr. Chairman, to your point, seasonal flu vaccine is now available widely uh, in uh, sites around the country. And again, we are urging people strongly, uh, particularly if they're in the target population for seasonal flu, to go ahead and get the seasonal flu vaccine uh, right now. We recently, just last week, had good news from studies being done both by NIH and manufacturers that a single dose of the vaccine rapidly in introduces a strong immune response in healthy adults. Um, we think that age group uh, could go down as low as age nine, but the clinical studies in children and pregnant women are still underway. So we don't have the full data about whether children will need two doses or not. They do in seasonal flu, younger children. Uh, we're still waiting for um, those results to be back. And Mr. Chairman, originally we thought that it would take up to 21 days for the um, immune response to be robust, and it's showing up in eight to 10 days. That's very good news. So one dose, eight to 10 days for uh, most of the population above age nine, uh, we think is is very um, positive step forward. Um, the trials in pregnant women are underway, as I said, and in children, and our expectation is that the vaccine will be a good match in protecting against these populations as well. Once ready, the vaccine will be shipped through a central distribution system and available in up to 90,000 sites around the country. Every state was asked to develop a plan and identify the appropriate vaccination sites. Our contractor is shipping directly to those sites, so there is not a, a glitch along the way. Um, two types of vaccine, a flu shot, made from inactivated virus and a nasal spray made from live weakened virus will be available free of charge uh, through, though some providers may charge an administration fee. And again, Congress um, did authorize funds uh, at the time of the supplemental uh, bill to cover some of the costs and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services has expended um, on top of that about a billion dollars in our funds to uh, get that process started before the supplemental funding was available. Uh, CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, recommended that initial doses of the H1N1 vaccine go to people at greatest risk of complications from the flu, as well as those who have frequent contact with people at risk. And we're working with states, territories, tribes, local communities, as well as the private sector to help distribute and administer the new H1N1 vaccine. Thanks to Congress, we've allocated $1.44 billion for states and hospitals for planning and preparation. The nation's current preparedness is a direct result of the investments and support of the Congress 
and the hard work of the HHS agencies and state and local officials across the country, both recently, but certainly over the last several years. So we look forward to continuing to work with Congress in the weeks and months ahead. Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to participate in the conversation, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, for that update. Uh, there are many members here because this is an important hearing, and I know you have to leave in a couple of hours in order to accommodate the members. Uh, what I'm going to do with uh, Mr. Barton's assent is uh, ask each member to ask one question. Uh, we will put the timer on at three minutes, but we'd, let, we'd appreciate if, if uh, members could ask just uh, one question, but no, no more than three minutes. Yeah. Mr. Barton, is that correct? Yes, and I, I want to let the minority members know that I support this. In fact, it's my recommendation. There is a precedent for this. Um, other cabinet secretaries that have been before the panel uh, we have adopted this practice. I think it's fair so that the junior members have an opportunity to ask a question as well as the senior members. Thank you, Mr. Barton. I'm going to start off the questions with uh, a more junior member to me, Mr. Markey. I thank the, I thank the chairman very much. Um, we've been sitting next to each other for 33 years. So. <laughs> and the 60s are great, too, Madam Secretary. Um, the, um, you know, the, one of the real questions that people have is the safety of this drug, and there was a real concern going back to uh, 1976, and that swine flu epidemic, uh, and uh, the diseases later uh, associated with the distribution of that drug. So, just so I can understand this, this drug has not yet been FDA approved. Is that correct? It just was licensed today. It was licensed today. Well, today. that's great news. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about what is different, be, what the difference is between this drug and the drug back in 1976 uh, in terms of what the FDA and the agency believe will be the impact on uh, Americans? Well, Mr. Markey, one of the um, first steps that the President took was to um, actually gathered the experts from 1976 together and asked for advice about what went right and what went wrong. And we had an opportunity to uh, meet with the, um, everybody from the then Secretary of Health and Environment to the Surgeon General to some of the scientists who were involved. And um, they gave some very good advice. Uh, the principal difference may not have been in the manufacturing of the drug, but the fact that the flu never spread so that the outbreak that was initially identified among about 200 soldiers in Fort Dix never went anywhere. Um, so a massive vaccination campaign was launched. About 40 million Americans were vaccinated, and yet there was no flu, not in America, not anywhere. Um, so we are in a very different situation today where we know this virus is spreading, and um, this vaccination vaccine is actually being manufactured exactly like the seasonal flu vaccine. It's showing up in the same way and it, it's using the same processes and procedures. Um, so in terms of the safety and efficacy, um, while there are clinical trials underway to determine the right dosage and, and really the efficacy of the vaccine, is it hitting the right target? Uh, there have been years of clinical trials and lots of data gathered on seasonal flu vaccines. So we are um, assured by the scientists that uh, lots of steps have been taken along the way to make sure that this will be a, a safe um, procedure. Um, there's been more oversight than in 76, um, better uh, made somewhat differently, more oversight in testing and in quality. Uh, so we do not anticipate the same problem. And as I say, if it were a different process than seasonal flu, we'd have more concerns, but it has been very similar. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Uh, Mr. Barton. Madam Secretary, I'm, I may have questions for the record, but my first, my one question is, is something that you may not be aware of. I was briefed this morning by officials from Texas A&M um, which is not in my district, but it is the school that I went to. They have developed a, a um, if I understood them correctly, a vaccination or a vaccine uh, that is made from hydroponic tobacco 
that they can produce up to 100 million doses very quickly if necessary. Are you familiar with that by any chance? Uh, Mr. Barton, I don't know about that vaccine. I do know that tobacco is one of the growing agents looked at as an alternative to the egg-based vaccines, but I don't... Could, I, could if, if, if I were to get the uh, researchers to uh, touch base with your staff, would, would you all absolutely. be willing to be briefed about that sure. program? Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Mr. Dingell? Uh, Mr. Dingell had to leave. Mr. Pallone? Thank you. Madam Secretary, I'm concerned about emergency room, hospital capacity, that type of thing. There was this report that was issued last month by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology that says there could be as many as 1.8 million hospitalizations in the United States during the epidemic, and of this 1.8 million, up to 300,000 could require intensive care units and those patients could occupy 50 to 100 percent of all ICU beds in affected areas at the peak of the epidemic. Um, you know, even without the epidemic, those ICUs normally operate close to capacity in my district. So what, what with regard to the nation's hospitals, um, I mean, do we have the surge capacity to meet this potential of demand? And can you tell us what steps the department is taking to help hospitals prepare for the, for the surge in cases? Um, Mr. Pallone, I think it's a it's a very um, a important question. Um, part of the uh, planning effort that was launched well before this virus was identified was in building surge capacity for hospitals, and um, billions of dollars have been invested over the last number of years. In fact, I had a chance here in D.C. to visit um, their five regional center sites that have been. Um, developed to get even increased capacity, and one is here uh, in Washington, D.C., and, and get a sense of what they're doing. Um, so there have been recent dollars put forward, but also dollars over the years to have that planning go on for surge capacity. Um, we are concerned that um, we also try and get information to the public as rapidly and as clearly as possible. The worst of all worlds is to have everybody show up at the hospital or come through an emergency room door. Um, the vast majority of individuals who get H1N1 so far are not um, terribly ill, do not require additional treatment, and certainly don't require testing to see what kind of flu they have. Um, so that we're trying to assure people the flu is the flu is the flu right now. CDC will continue to test through hospitals and other areas those who are getting um, seriously ill so we can monitor the cases, but the testing isn't, isn't required. So we have resources to hospitals. We are um, helping with uh, systems that um, will put in place additional medical capacity uh, everybody from the Medical Reserve Corps to additional personnel who we can help um, with assistance. So we don't think um, at this point that the, um, the PCAS, the Presidential Advisors scenario, um, is the most likely scenario to happen. We watch the Southern Hemisphere very closely and what they have done for surge capacity, and again, we'll learn a lot from them, but they had no critical emergencies that weren't able to happen with shifting some space. So I think at this point, we're doing everything we can to get people ready and, and provide for some alternative, but part of it is to diminish, hopefully, the strain on hospitals by encouraging people to uh, go to the website to learn more, to call a pr primary care provider, and uh, urge them to just take steps that they would with the regular flu. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Mr. Deal? Thank you. I would like to ask about the distribution of the vaccine when it becomes available. Uh, will the distribution be uh, sent to the states and the states determine where it will go to within their states? And will there be a determination of how much goes to each state and what will be the factors that will be looked at in determining how many doses a state would be allocated? 
the distribution is based on a per capita um, basis, and states absolutely develop their plans, working with their emergency personnel, their local health departments and others to determine the vaccination sites. So again, the distribution contract is not going to go to one central site in a state uh, as the traditional vaccine. It's going directly to the sites that have already been predetermined. States were asked to send plans to the CDC, part of the resources provided by Congress, helped with that planning effort, and the, the contract will be up to 90,000 sites that have already been determined. So it will be some traditional, you know, providers' offices and health clinics and hospitals but also a number of, of non-traditional sites. Could I ask one brief question on that? That per capita amount, is that determined by who the CDC thinks should be eligible for getting the vaccination or just a general no, per capita? It is a, it is a general per capita amount in terms of how it rolls out. We will have enough vaccine available for everyone. Um, there is enough on order. We're looking now at the reorders for the one dose versus two dose. There will be enough vaccine. What we're concerned about is getting it to the priority populations as quickly as possible. And that's what we've asked the states to focus on, how to get you know, pregnant women, children under the age of 24, caregivers of infants, health care workers, how to make sure that those folks get to the front of the line, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Mr. Green. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, uh, I've read several articles in the media indicating the administration supports voluntary school-based vaccination to protect our children from the H1N1. And, uh, and I'm a co-sponsor, along with my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, uh, with a pilot program, HR 2596, to allow HHS to perform a voluntary multi-state demonstration project to test the feasibility of using the nation's elementary schools and secondary schools as an influenza vaccination centers in coordination with school nurses, uh, school health programs and local health departments, community health providers, uh, insurance companies, private and state insurance agencies and private insurance. And I'm pleased that bill is part of HR 3200. Would the administration support a voluntary multi-state school-based seasonal influenza and H1N1 vaccination program such as was created in uh, HR 2596. And let me say uh, that uh, that version, I know Senator Reid in the Senate is looking to do a national version of that uh, particular provision. Well, Mr. Green, I, what we're going to have is a, a demonstration, national demonstration project of the bill you just suggested going on in the next couple of months. And uh, certainly our leadership at the Centers for Disease Control feels strongly that if um, we are successful in using schools as partners in vaccination, that that may be a great way to um, enhance uh, the vaccination take-up rate uh, going forward for seasonal flu and other issues. Um, I'm old enough that um, I was part of the group with the early polio vaccine, and we got that vaccine at school. Um, you know, that was always a partner. And this effort, we have school districts who are very eager to be vaccination sites and are, are standing by to do that. So we'll know a lot about your um, voluntary program, and we think it probably will be a very good idea. And being part of the sugar cube generation also, uh, that uh, I think this is important. Again, it needs to be voluntary. Right. Um, Right. Uh, but we can have a great deal of more coverage by dealing with our, our schools, our centers, and our community. And well, we're talking about our children. Given the age group uh, that this uh, virus is targeting, we thought schools and actually daycare centers and others are, are very appropriate outreach sites to reach the population who we need to reach. And so um, working closely with the Secretary of Education and his counterparts, superintendents and governors, and I think most governors are very enthusiastic of having the schools be voluntary vaccination sites. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, would be, Mr. Murphy, you'd be next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to have you here, Madam Secretary. Thank uh, and thank you for all your work you're doing on health care, too. As part of this, I'm, I'm assuming that part of the analysis you did with regard to this virus, uh, if it was unchecked and unabated, the impact it would have overall on America's health care system, including the cost. One of the issues this committee is trying to grapple with, as 
you are, uh, is the cost of health care in America. We have an impossible time getting information from the Congressional Budget Office on anything that has to do with prevention. Therefore, I'm wondering if your uh, office has gathered some information, analyzed uh, that as this, for example, as these vaccinations are advanced out there earlier, uh, what we are saving and what is this overall savings that comes from, yes, the government is spending money to move these out there, but what is the impact on saving money? and saving health care costs, um, and one of you have any information. If not, could you get it to us? Because this committee really would like to have some of that, if I could say so, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Murphy, I will certainly look to see what kind of cost effectiveness or strategies we have put together. I'm not sure. I think we can tell you probably and, and gather it for you, the cost of what happens with um, seasonal flu every year, the, the um, 200,000 hospitalizations, the 36,000 deaths, you know, what the impact is. I, I would suggest, though, what we don't have is then a huge um, sort of social cost. Uh, one of the projections absent a vaccine of this virus spreading, even, even in a relatively mild case, which would be 200,000 hospitalizations, 36,000 deaths. That's what seasonal flu looks like every year. Uh, but if you have a widespread part of the population who misses work, uh, what the impact is then on businesses and trade, whether you can even do continuity of businesses if you have essential workers missing. Uh, part of the issue about schools is what happens if half the teachers are sick or, you know, how do people go to work if half the kids are sick. Um, so I, I don't know that we have added those costs, but we can try to put together some information for you. I, I would appreciate that. that if you could get that to the chairman, because it is yes. a type of modeling which we just don't have, not only in terms of uh, scenarios of analysis, but now we have something very real that we anticipated could have an impact on the workforce, education, as well as direct and indirect medical costs. And I appreciate if you get that to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Uh, I want to call on Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thanks to a very capable former governor and a very capable team uh, for putting in place a plan to prepare, not scare the public. Uh, I do want to commend you on the tone of this plan, which has, I think, overcome a lot of the original hysteria that uh, met uh, the, the uh, early stories about the effect of this illness. So thank you very much. My question really is, uh, taking this to the next level or perhaps to the next problem. Is this uh, basic set of protocols we now have in place and the uh, public pitch that we are making quite effectively about this strain of uh, flu, uh, will, will this be, could this be applicable to uh, perhaps a pandemic that's more severe? a possible a biological attack uh, in our country or other huge uh, health challenges that might arise. And if, if this set of procedures and protocols and tone that we're using is not applicable, what steps can you take now uh, to be sure it does, uh, we, we, are, we are able to adapt it to future problems we don't presently anticipate? Well, I think that's a great question, and no question about the fact that Congress, working with the prior administration, put in place steps, really, that have been executed over the last six or seven years of uh, not only uh, resources that have um, amplified efforts within the Department of Health and Human Services, including you know, our own um, vaccine development operation, enhancements to NIH and Centers for Disease Control and FDA, uh, but certainly resources at the state and local level and a lot of planning. As a former governor, um, we went through pandemic planning. I never dreamed I'd be sort of here um, with a pandemic, but uh, we called together uh, efforts over the years. So. I think at, at a minimum, um, what is happening over the next several months will enhance our entire public health infrastructure. Uh, having hospitals look at the spring where the gaps were, redouble efforts to get ready for the fall is enormously helpful, how they direct resources, looking at workforce issues, how to get 
you know, vaccinations to people. Um, a huge challenge, and it's an ongoing challenge, is just information, how to make sure uh, folks can access timely, accurate information in a very transparent fashion and walk that balance between complacency and panic, uh, but get people prepared and ready. So I, I don't think there's any question that what we do over the next several months will significantly prepare us for whatever challenge is next. We know whether that's a natural disaster or a a man-made disaster, that, that infrastructure strength, the communication strategies, working with the partnerships, not only throughout government but in the private sector, is enormously helpful and is exactly what region by region, we just haven't done it nationally um, really in 40 years. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. And Ms. Blackburn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Secretary. Thank you for taking the time to come and talk with us today. I am pleased that you are here and I don't envy the task in front of you. I know it's going to be a rough flu season from what we're <coughs> seeing and hearing already and I do think the free flow of information is going to be an imperative as we try to handle this with our districts, with schools, with uh, public events that are taking place. You've testified before our committee twice. And the first time that you came, we were working on the health care reform bill. And now we're looking at what could end up being one of the uh, as significant to our constituents as uh, the impact of that health care reform bill. This is a public health situation that we know is going to be in front of us to deal with uh, this event. Now, when you were here before and we talked about um, the issues dealing with um, with with health care, we talked a little bit about the 10 care uh, situation. I asked you about some of the issues that were there. Uh, your responses took a while to get to me. They were a single sentence, and that prompted another question, and I just received the response to those today. Uh, so I do thank you for getting those. But I, um, I do ask that as we move forward that knowing that this is going to be critical that we have timely and accurate information that we do have that free flow of exchange as this public health issue affects our districts and maybe a little bit more timely than the response to the questions which was a little bit curt and inadequate and uh, bordering on disrespectful I do want to say thank you for the widgets I appreciate that those are on your website and that we can link to those. And I do want to ask you, as we're talking about the supplies and the supplies being let to the states, uh, and you mentioned those that are most vulnerable to the flu, are are the those that the physicians and the caregivers that are going to administer the flu shots? Do they have a ranking or a priority system, or will the states work that out? Are they going to take seniors and pregnant women first, or do you have? Can you give us any guidance on what that protocol is going to be for who gets to go at the front of the line? Well, Congresswoman, um, we have. Um not tried to determine for states the most appropriate way to get to their target populations. We thought that was a local and okay. regional decision. We have done a lot of work with the provider community, uh, outreach directly to OBGYNs, outreach to primary care docs, to health clinics, with the health infrastructure. Uh, but states are submitting plans based on their own determination, region by region, area by area, how best to target their vulnerable populations, and that's where the vaccine will so be. So our best response to those populations when they call our office is consult your local physician. In terms of where to get the vaccine? And who gets priority? Well, their local physician won't be determining who gets the priority. Again, the state health department Okay. has determined that, and okay. that information should be available right now. There will be vaccine for everyone. Gentlewoman's time. Roll off the production line simultaneously. So the state is really, has predetermined where the priority areas are, what sites should okay. get it. Thank you, ma'am. Y'all back. 
Thank you. Gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Sebelius, for your testimony. There were several um, very encouraging items of, of uh, news in terms of uh, the hope that one dose will be sufficient, that um, it will be uh, getting the desired uh, immune impacts within 8 to 10 days, and that you think you'll have sufficient uh, dosage for uh, for everyone, um, starting with priority targets. I have a few questions, very short questions related to that vaccine, the vaccine issue. Um, and then in follow-up, we'll submit some written questions on strengthening our public health system, uh, work, addressing workforce shortage issues and technology uh, issues. But on the vaccine, um, three quick questions. Of the 195 million doses ordered, is the hope that you can reach everyone through use of the adjuvant that you've also ordered. Um, and, and so tell me a little bit about the, um, the, the use of adjuvant during this season. Second, um, I know that we had a shortage of seasonal flu vaccine, I think back in 2004 when there was a closure of a production facility in the UK. Um, we did not have a lot of domestic manufacturing capacity at that point. I believe that has changed, but I wonder if you could tell me of the five uh, manufacturers that we're working with for these dosage, where their facilities are located domestically versus foreign. And then I believe you announced in your testimony that four out of the five um, manufacturers have been approved today by the FDA. Um, what's the status of the fifth? Is there any reason we should be worried? No adjuvant is currently um, anticipated to be used in the United States at all. Um, there are some uh, backup plans if things took a terrible turn for the worse. We have never used in any widespread area an adjuvanted vaccine, so uh, the scientists strongly recommended that we not head down that path um, in this time. Um, the current purchases are likely to be enhanced to get to the point what you've uh, reported is the initial purchases, but as we see the take-up rate, as we get the rest of the clinical trials, we will make the purchases based on what is anticipated the take-up rate is for 300 million potential users. As you know, 100 percent of the people will never get vaccinated for anything, unfortunately. Um, we currently have five facilities. Uh, in the year that we ran out of vaccine, there was one. Uh, and or I'm sorry, we were down to one. There were two, but Correct. one was um, debilitated. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, unfortunately, exactly where they are. I will get you that information I back. But there, what I was told yesterday by the um, vaccine committee is that we fully anticipate that all five will be licensed. There were some um, final steps needed to be taken in the final contract. Just, just on the domestically, domestic production and vaccines being made in America, I remember uh, a particularly um, telling hearing during the last administration where um, if we were having a particularly vir virulent pandemic, uh, the presumption was that if we weren't de manufacturing it here in the U.S., it would not be available to us in the U.S., and I certainly hope that we are bolstering our domestic production of vaccine. What I'm General Eddie's time. Greatly enhanced, and most of it is domestic. Sorry. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Gingry. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you uh, very much for being with us again. And, uh, let me just say at the outset that uh, the, your efforts along with uh, those of uh, Secretary uh, Janet Napolitano when way back, I guess, in, uh, in June, July, when, uh, when you were getting confirmed, I think you've done a great job, no question about it. I don't think anybody could ever accuse you uh, of being katrina on this issue. Uh, you've you've uh, gotten a lot of money appropriated toward this effort. and. Uh, my only concern uh, back then, a little bit lesser now, was the the, the issue of creating uh, a pandemic of fear, and I, I mentioned that to you, and, and you you have already addressed that in your testimony. Uh, but I, I want to ask you about particularly about uh, pregnant women because uh, that was uh, what I did uh, in my previous life as an OBGYN physician. 
uh, and I have three adult daughters and, and, and a daughter-in-law and nine grandchildren. The daughter-in-law just had uh, a, a baby three weeks ago. Congratulations. It, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Very concerned was she, though, uh, about this, uh, this issue of the uh, uh, swine flu and what should she do and, and that sort of thing, questions about what, if she got it, what would be the risk to her, especially in the third trimester as she was then, and, uh, and what was the risk to the fetus. Uh, and I think that we, we need to get more information. I noticed uh, on WebMD, uh, a, a recent uh, printout from WebMD, uh, July 29, 2009, it says, pregnant women, even if they are healthy, are at high risk of hospitalization and death from H1N1 swine flu, the CDC reports. Now, I, I would like for you to answer that question. Are they, I mean, I know they're at increased risk over the general population and, and there, there are certain issues with uh, uh, decreased lung capacity and not as uh, vigorous immune response because of their pregnancy. Uh, it does put them at higher risk than the general population of women. Uh, but are they at high risk of hospitaliz hospitalization and death? And I think the answer to that is probably no, but uh, comment on that, if you will. Um, Congressman, what we saw in the spring is that um, pregnant women constitute about 1 percent of the population. Uh, they were 6 percent of the hospitalizations and deaths that occurred, uh, a significantly out of kilter population and previous, with no underlying health condition other than the pregnancy. Yeah. So we're not talking about somebody who had diabetes going into pregnancy or someone with chronic lung condition. Yeah, definitely at higher risk than yes. the general population, maybe as and much as five times, a factor of five. Um, six would be the, uh, so in terms of the um, outreach, we have tried to be, and that, that was not only the U.S. data that's showing up around the world, that again, um, pregnancy seems to be in and of itself an underlying health condition that significantly enhances the risk. So um, I know that for a lot of uh, pregnant women, I certainly did this myself, was reluctant to take anything uh, during the, the term of the pregnancy. Um, but on talking to a number of OBGYNs, looking at the data, talking to the scientists, there is a great belief that the risk of any sort of um, event occurring because of the vaccine far is outweighed by the risk that occurs without being vaccinated. And in your daughter's case, a new mom, uh, babies under six months old are not recommended for the vaccine. So another of the um, target population is caregivers of infants six months and younger to try and protect the infant. So. Uh, you sort of have Madam to, Chair, I realize that my time. Can, can I do a real quickie question? Maybe we can do a second round. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I yield back. And thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here with us today again. Um, in states and cities across our country, local public health departments are really getting decimated by budget cuts. In my hometown of Sacramento, the public health department has already had to cut 17 percent of its budget this year alone. These cuts mean that in my district alone, the public health department will be losing three communicable disease specialists and two microbiologists from a public health lab. This is on top of losses in field nursing staff, bioterrorism preparedness workers, and other people who work behind the scenes every day testing samples for H1N1 virus and other communicable diseases. Madam Secretary, the one bright spot in the statistics I just mentioned is that my local public health department will be able to retain at least some positions thanks to a one-time infusion of recovery package dollar, dollars. What other plans um, do we have at CDC or in a department at large to help local public health departments cope with the huge responsibilities they're going to have soon and also too what is a plan if the virus mutates sometime soon so we have a greater pandemic emergency? Well, Congresswoman, the uh, part of the planning effort has certainly been to recognize that um, the situation you're describing in California is nationwide, um, that public health agencies have been 
um, severely hampered by the budget cuts, so that the resources, the $1.4 billion, which was pushed out, uh, hopefully will help enhance that. We've also um, reactivated the, um, the Commission core, the um, emergency um, group of retired uh, medical providers and volunteers who came together after 9-11. They're now about 200,000 strong throughout the country, registered in every state, and kind of put them on notice to help with the vaccination efforts and had them call, able to be called upon. We do have our commission core of health workers who, again, can be brought in to supplement um, some of the state-based efforts, but every state, as they submitted plans to CDC, recognizes that part of the challenge in dealing with this is a restricted um, core of personnel, of trained personnel. Um, again, we're not urging folks to continue with the testing protocol. That was important early on to determine, but right now we're just moving more to the vaccination and mitigation phases to try and just diminish the the circulation of the flu. So some of the earlier activities hopefully will be shifted into the vaccination effort. Gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Secretary Sebelius, appreciate you coming before us. And since all my colleagues asked the questions that I had regarding the H1N1 uh, situation, um, concerning last week's uh, testimony of the President's address to the joint session of Congress. Uh, there were uh, some things that he had said regarding the, I guess, the new developments on the health care debate. Uh, since the bill that passed out of this committee, uh, the, the Congressional Budget Office testified that it would add $239 billion to the debt and that 8 million illegal aliens would have access to the government plan. Uh, since the President in his statements last week said that he wouldn't sign a bill that would add to the deficit and, and wouldn't allow illegals, would you support changes that would be necessary to make H.R. 3200, which passed out of this committee, uh, comply with those two initiatives that President Obama stated before the joint session to uh, make sure that the bill doesn't add to the deficit, which right now it would add, and then to make sure illegal aliens wouldn't have access to the government plan, which CBO testified 8 million would? Um, Congressman, I'm um, pleased to have any number of discussions on health reform and uh, and you know it's a top priority of the administration, and I'd be pleased to come back and do that. The chairman asked that this hearing be on H1N1, and I would like to defer to that. I, I don't know. But I mean, we never had the opportunity to ask you, because your, your only testimony to us was at a time when you had acknowledged you hadn't looked at the details of the bill. Uh, so really, we're not going to have another opportunity that I know of uh, to, to talk to you personally about the concerns we have that are in H.R. 3200, but which the is the Will the gentleman yield? Uh, in, in will the gentleman question, yield to the chair? I would yield, yes. Uh, uh, I would advise the gentleman on behalf of the chairman that he does intend to have further discussions and uh, meetings and hearings, and the chairman really has asked the secretary to come and be prepared today to talk about the H1N1 situation, and, and I think it, you know, you, obviously members are allowed to ask any questions they like, but I think the secretary is really prepared on that topic today, and I can communicate to the chairman that we're, that he should have the secretary back, and I know she's willing to come. And I mean, and I, I appreciate that. The, the problem we have is that these discussions are ongoing every day. There could be a bill on the House floor. Uh, we don't have any assurance that we're going to have a hearing before a vote occurs. And I would imagine that the Secretary is well versed in these issues because uh, I know you were in the joint session with us last week in the House chamber when the President made those firm commitments. He said he would not sign a bill that added to the deficit by a dime. He said that he would not support illegals getting access to health care. And yet, in the CBO testimony, uh, CBO sat here in the, in the chair you're sitting in and said, Eight million illegal aliens would have access to the government plan under the bill that you supported, and he said that it would add $239 billion to the deficit. So I'm sure you understand those issues. You, you were there at the speech last week. I, I'm sure you have some ideas of how we can fix that. We've got ideas of how we can fix those problems, but would you support the fixes that would be necessary to make the bill conform with what the President said before Congress? Congressman, as a recovering legislator, I, I'm reluctant to sign off on any legislative language. I, I'd be happy to take a look at it to see if I could support it. I certainly support 
what the president stated uh, going forward that he, I mean, he will sign or not sign a bill. I, I think you can um, right. actually And we presented, and you weren't here, I know, but, but we presented I, I have some of those amendments the CBO here in committee testimony. to I haven't fix those it. two problems, to specifically fix those two problems. If they were voted send down me by the that committee. Language, but, I'd be delighted and I'd like to, to get ahead. the commitment from the, the acting chair that we would be able to get the secretary back before any vote is taken on the House floor. I think that's very important so that we get these questions answered. The gentleman's time has expired. I did give him extra time because of the colloquy. And, and uh, I know the chairman will work with the secretary to make sure we can get her back here uh, to answer any questions people may have. And with that, I'll recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Ms. Gett. As far as the last gentleman, Section 246 of the bill makes it very clear illegal aliens are not uh, available to get uh, health care underneath H.R. 3200. And if you remember, since you sat through the markup with us, the space amendment did S-CHIP and Medicaid also made it illegal. That was unanimously adopted by the committee. But uh, so be it. Uh, let's move on to H.N. 1N. Um, currently, states are expected to purchase a portion of the need, needed uh, vaccine to protect their citizens. But it includes a 25 percent subsidy from the federal government. And my concern is a lot of our states are suffering right now because of the economic downturn and may not be able to meet their obligation because of limited resources or operational constraints. Is there some kind of a plan available under DHS to help some of these states like Michigan, California, others that are going to be struggling? I don't want anyone not to get it because of states' budget concerns. Congressman, the, um, through the resources that um, Congress has provided and through the resources from the Department of Health and Human Services, the vaccine will be free, uh, distributed to the states free. They are not expected to have a cost share. I think um, there has been a cost share associated with their purchase of antivirals, right. which are in the stockpile, but not with the vaccine. Okay. The vaccine is free, going to be distributed. There may be an administration fee by the provider, but there is no fee to get the vaccine. What about the antiviral then? The, the States have purchased antivirals uh, okay. over the years in a stockpile. Those are being pushed out as we speak, and the department is continuing to replenish that stockpile, and if needed, will supply those to states. Okay, so no state should have to worry about not being able to afford or obtain the antivirals. That's correct. That's okay. what we're trying to do with the resources. Let me ask you right now. It's flu season now, traditional flu season, and people are getting their shots. Is there some kind of waiting period they should have before they get their seasonal flu and the H1N1 flu shot? Well, again, since uh, we don't anticipate um, the s real supply of H1N1 until October 15th, we're saying right. people get it now. It's my understanding that the clinical trials underway right now are looking at whether or not there is any um, harm to simultaneously getting the flu shot. And as we get closer to October, we'll have that data available. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, I said, I'm, I'm from northern Michigan, and, and we share border with Canada. We go back and forth daily. And we're doing a lot of preparation on this side. Is there any special considerations being given to border communities, whether southern border or northern border? What are they doing in those countries, especially as we're moving back? It seems like we've got a much more robust program here in this country. I haven't seen the same in Canada or especially Canada. The um, Department of Homeland Security looked carefully at that issue and the scientific advice during the spring, and it was determined that since there was already a, um, a robust outbreaking of H1N1 already within our borders, that border closings really would harm commerce potentially, but not really help with the disease outbreak. So there is no anticipation at this point to do anything with our northern and southern borders. Why well, we want to see a border closing, but are you coordinating with other countries to make sure, like Canada in particular, to make sure that we're doing basically the same thing, there same education program? There definitely has been a lot of um, uh, national and international discussions, and particularly with Canada and Mexico. Uh, that has been underway since the early spring and will continue. Very good. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I appreciate the Chair's commitment to have the Secretary come back uh, before the committee, before we have a vote on the uh, uh, health care overhaul bill in the House. I, I, ha I don't have that power, but I'm going to talk to the chairman but, who does have that power. And if you had that power, you'd give us that commitment, I know. I appreciate that because a lot of us share that concern. I, uh, I also want to draw attention to the secretary to a letter, that a bipartisan letter Mr. Rogers, Mr. Gonzalez and I and others sent to you recently regarding the 2010 fee schedule and 
Medicare as it relates to cardiologists and oncologists and the proposed cuts that could be as high as 40 percent in some codes. Uh, if you haven't gotten that, I, I don't expect you to uh, be on top of every letter that comes your direction, but if you could flag that one, we, we'd appreciate your response. I was reading a story in the, in the paper, one of the papers coming out here yesterday from Oregon about the problem in the southern hemisphere related to H1N1 as it related to um, folks in the hospital trying to, uh, to deal with those who are sick. And they raised the, the issue in the story, at least, that the hospital workers, the nurses, the doctors, others, did not have a sufficient and uh, early supply of masks and other protective equipment to prevent uh, the spread within the hospital setting. Are, are, are you and your folks um, confident that in these environments where all of us who get sick are going to rush, that there is adequate, uh, 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 whatever we call it, uh, um, the materials, the, the masks, the protective equipment, the whatever, so that those we rely upon for our health care will in and of themselves be healthy in the process and not at an unnecessary risk? Congressman, that discussion is um, actively underway, and as I say, the guidance from the CDC is um, about to be issued. We, um, there, the scientists have not been in um, complete agreement about the right protocol, particularly with the use of respiratory. Right, I've read that. Yeah. Going forward, so the request went to the Institute of Medicine to do a sort of rapid response study. They came back with a protocol which I would suggest is, is the ideal case scenario, a respirator per provider for every patient seen. Um, wow. There are not adequate supplies to follow that protocol. So um, one new respirator for every patient. Every time you see a patient, the doctor or nurse would have to put on a new respirator? That's what wow. the IOM suggested. Yeah. And the stockpiles uh, in the country and the manufacturing capacity would not allow us to follow that protocol. So right now, um, we are working actively with OSHA and CDC and the health care providers to uh, develop uh, a protocol that actually um, is more in fitting with what the supply looks like because IOM was told not to take into account what's available or what could be available over the next six months. Unfortunately, the reality is we got to look at what's available. So that discussion is actively underway and, as we and, speak. And on that topic, the Vice President had said at one point, and I think he probably regretted that he wouldn't put his family on an airplane, et cetera, et cetera. I was on an airplane yesterday, and the person behind me was coughing, and I am convinced was taking no precautions about the emissions. I directed the air filter to flow backwards. <laughs> What, what advice and counsel do you have for all of us about, I, I realize we ought to cover our mouths and all, but, but if you're on the other side of that, should we be wearing those kinds of protective um, face masks when the outbreak comes? Is it, is it going to be helpful or is that just overboard? Um, what I've been told by um, the scientist is that um, probably not. Um, masks are really not, if you are in a, in a caregiver capacity in a home situation coming in close contact, it may provide some protection, but basically no. Um, that, and if you, if this continues to present much like seasonal flu, um, and you know, a number of people get hospitalized with seasonal flu every year, uh, we don't have that kind of rigid, um, fitted mass protocol underway. So we're trying to balance safety and security. What's most alarming, and I think all of you would be great to help with, uh, healthcare workers right now don't get vaccinated. Um, less than 50 percent of healthcare workers ever get vaccinated for seasonal flu. Even though they're a priority group for H1N1, we're afraid that take-up rate may be the same. So I would say that's step one is to take advantage of the protection that's there with the vaccination, both with seasonal flu and um, then with, um, you know, the H1N1 vaccine, because they're at the front of the line, and, and we would hope that they, they do that. Gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for uh, being here with us again today. Um, individuals uh, 25 to 64 with underlying medical conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and compromised immune systems are one of the target groups for the forthcoming vaccine. Um, as you know, racial and ethnic minorities are disproportionately affected by all of these chronic diseases and more. 
are your clinical mm -hmm. trials, are the people in the clinical trials diverse? And what outreach is being, has been done uh, cult that is culturally and linguistically appropriate to reach these sometimes hard to reach populations, often with poor public health infrastructure to ensure that they get the adequate prevention, uh, treatment, and, and so forth? The clinical trials, it's my understanding, are diverse, and we're aware of the concerns that have been raised in the past. Um, again, a lot of the um, trials underway are specifically about dosage because uh, the clinical trials have been done for years on seasonal flu, which, which deal a lot with outcomes. Um, the challenge of communication and outreach strategies is one that we're taking very seriously. So. Uh, traditional media is being used, non-traditional media, ethnic-specific media, so translating everything on the website into Spanish, into Vietnamese automatically, and then other languages can be requested as needed, uh, looking at um, a variety of uh, media outreach that um, reach non-traditional community, working with the faith-based and community outreach. Okay, because a, a lot of these communities also are not connected. Right. So we're using the faith-based groups to connect. Um, for the younger population, it's an equal challenge. So uh, Facebook and Twitter and ESPN has agreed to become a partner for the scrolls they put across college dorms. Um, uh, we have a PSA um, contest on YouTube in terms of trying to get to people. So we're really trying to maximize and special outreach to minority providers and health clinics, knowing that they are likely to see a lot of folks with underlying health conditions who need to understand how serious the risk is for this, for this virus where nobody has an immunity. Gentleman, uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Sibelius, I, I guess I should point out for healthcare providers of my age, we were, most of us in the midst of our training during the last swine flu outbreak during the Ford administration and remember very vividly some of the problems encountered. So as information is gathered as to the safety of this vaccine, I think it is extremely important to get that out and, and get it disseminated. Um, we had a big problem in Fort Worth, Texas with the first round of this in the spring. The uh, school district closed, and I would say, I think appropriately so, but, but they received a great deal of criticism. Um, the school district across the Trinity River in Dallas did not close, and, and obviously there were a lot of comparisons made between the, the decisions of the two school districts still. I think Superintendent Johnson did exactly as she should have when she was confronted with a large number of suspected cases and could not get information back in a timely fashion from the CDC as far as recommendations. Um, to prevent that type of difficulty from occurring again in the fall, I asked and, and your uh, department was kind to respond and we did a, a, a seminar on, AV, um, on uh, H1N1 in Fort Worth uh, this past August and we had representatives not just from HHS but from DHS and CDC as well as the, uh, the state and county health departments. The impression I got from that day's discussion was that the decisions about closure or non-closure of schools would be left up to the local authorities. But then, seems like less than 48 hours later, the guidelines were coming down that, that your department would decide when schools should close. So I would just simply ask the question, who is going to be making these decisions? Is it the local folks? Is it you? Is it Secretary Duncan from the, uh, from the Education Department? Who is going to be making these decisions? Because it obviously impacts uh, not just the, the school year of the kids, the, the learning cur curricula of the children, uh, but in Texas, of course, we have, like many other states, we have a testing protocol under No Child Left Behind, and we don't want to see our school districts unnecessarily penalized, but we won't, don't want to see our school districts take unnecessary risk with the, the children's safety. School closure, um, both in the spring and, and now um, moving forward, are always a local decision. 
uh, that's made at the local level. Having said that, the Centers for Disease Control has issued school guidance, um, and it's just that guidance, what they're seeing from the science and what they would recommend. And at this point, uh, the guidance is different than what was being uh, discussed this spring, in part because we didn't know how lethal the disease would be, and it was very unclear um, whether or not sending your child to school could indeed um, cause much more serious harm. Now we've learned a lot over the spring and summer, learned a lot from the Southern Hemisphere, and so the guidance issued by the Centers for Disease Control and put forward by Secretary Duncan and others in outreach to schools across this country is really leaning toward keeping schools open, having protocols available in the school to deal with outbreak, isolating kids, sending them home, uh, trying to make sure that um, teachers and students are um, vaccinated, but keeping schools open. That could change. The flu could change. Uh, we're watching it very closely, but the school decision will continue to be made at the local level. Gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for uh, all of your efforts in educating the country on H1N1. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not unlike uh, the millions of parents across the country uh, that have been, we've been teaching our, our kids, you know, wash your hands all the time, cover your cough. Uh, we haven't altered substantially the way we live our lives. Uh, so this Saturday, we had a dozen nine and 10 year olds over for my 10 year old daughter's birthday party. And um, they did not protest when I had them wash their hands before snacks, wash their hands again before cake, wash their hands again uh, at the, towards the end of the evening. And, uh, but wouldn't you know it that um, <clears throat> one of my daughter's friends uh, got sick at the party and her mother called me yesterday and sure enough, it's H1N1. Now in the, of course she's staying home from school and there are a number of kids out this week. Uh, but parents want to know, and your guidance is very good, the CDC guidance is very good, but the question I hear a lot from, from neighbors and other parents you know, how long, how long does the child have to stay out of school? Uh, and this guidance uh, says that, that a person who has it can infect others up to five to seven days after getting sick. But it also says that it's okay to go back to school 24 hours after the fever is gone. So what is, what is the most consistent answer I can give to um, parents of a child that has, has just come down with the H1N1? I think the, um, the scientists are saying 24 hours after the fever is gone without any medication to lessen the fever. And the problem is that um, for the kind of average, maybe five to seven days, a lot of kids it may be two to three days and then 24 hours later they're ready to go. So it's hard to give you a date specific, I think it's a child to child situation. Some have more serious cases, some have lesser cases, but 24 hours without any medication uh, since the time you've had a fever, they say is safe to go back. Even though they could still infect well, other kids a few days after that? Yeah, the, uh, the doctor is telling me <laughs> What they're seeing is that the vast majority can't infect at that point, and that's why they've arrived at this 24 hours after, after the fever. Terrific. Um, okay, thank you very much. Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for joining us. And um, I think everyone is concerned about the public health implications, but there's some unintended consequences of the public health campaign that I think we also need to be conscious of. And one of the concerns that I expressed at an earlier hearing when we had representatives of the CDC here was the decision to refer to this virus generically as swine flu, despite its origins, and the enormous negative impact it's had on our pork industry because of a lot of myths and mis conceptions. And yet I know that public health officials have determined that it's easier to get college students' attention about the need for getting 
prepared and exercising precautions when you refer to it by the name swine flu as opposed to H1N1. So we've got these conflicting things going on. And one of the things that I'm very concerned about is how we balance those interests given the enormous economic implications to states like mine when people have half-truths and misinformation and yet the reports that I've seen uh, as recently as this weekend in the Washington Post, uh, Sebelius encouraging news regarding swine flu vaccine, their choice, not yours. Thank you. Um, <laughs> New York Times, one vaccine shot seen as protective for swine flu. So how, how can we address the enormous public health challenge that we're all legitimately concerned about and still address this enormous negative economic impact that it's had on our pork industry? Congressman, it's a great question, and I can tell you it's one that we're wrestling with a lot. I, I hope never out of my mouth have you ever heard that other term, and um, or out of CDC or NIH or uh, the FDA, and I have taken it on as a bit of a personal mission when I'm with media um, reporters and being interviewed to correct them and and ask that they please use the terminology that's accurate because there's a lot of misinformation. And we have on several occasions, and I've joined with um, Secretary Vilsack and, and again, the other side of this, assuring people that nothing at all in this flu is related to eating pork. You can't get it from pork. There's no um, crossover. But you're absolutely, I know there has been over a billion dollars, if I understand it, um, and that may be very underestimated at this point. Um, and I, you know, we'd welcome any suggestions. Um, I think it's, it's easier to do, so they do it. Um, but I, I would agree it's a huge challenge, and it has an enormous economic impact. I've even suggested, and maybe you want to um, conduct your own media campaign, that maybe we should um, challenge people to use the right terminology, and you could send them a pork chop every time they use the right term, but take it away. Or they could come to the Congressional Rack of Pork reception tomorrow night in the long run. <laughs> Where is it? Chair, the chair uh, now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Sebelius, you've been very patient this afternoon, and I hope that this won't take the full five minutes, but I want to thank you, and I want the record to note that you really did hit the ground running after your confirmation. You had a lot of issues on your plate. I've seen you everywhere on both health care reform um, in very positive ways and also on this topic. And I'm referring to um, a bicameral briefing that you and several secretaries presented to members of Congress. It was midsummer, if I'm not mistaken, in between, sort of like the spring right. outbreak. And I, my, my question then was to acknowledge the role that a school nurse played in the first case in the Bronx that resulted in massive school closures. And as a former school nurse, I sort of emphasized, um, I know why, why districts close their uh, schools, but the, it's chaotic when it happens. Um, parents have to. Parents don't have backup plans a lot of times, too, and they miss work and all the things that ensue. And you find kids on the mall and all kinds of places on, on when that happens. So now I'm pleased to follow the the chain of, of questions that have been asked. Asked, and I'll I'll since this topic has come up, I'm interested in the nuances now that have occurred watching the epidemic as it has proceeded. And now as this school season hit and many of the campuses, uh, the, a little older teenager, I mean uh, young adults, um, and that captive environment which can be dealt with somewhat uh, differently because they're uh, not so dependent on, on parents and jobs and things. But still, I'd like to have you address just for a minute for the record um, because the relationship between your, your department and CDC and the local communities is, is very specific and I think unlike many other departments with very direct communication and uh, outline for us a few of the ways uh, that you have been working with local uh, health departments as they then are partners with local school districts to formulate and get the right kind of advice uh, tailored to different parts of the country uh, so that we, we behave in the proper way as this comes out, both in, in terms of immunizations, the vaccination plan, and also what to do when, when like our, my colleague Kathy Castor's own uh, child 
daughter's friend, you know, what, how do you respond? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, since the spring, uh, I would say the three cabinet secretaries who have been um, sort of at the forefront of this effort are um, Secretary Napolitano with the Homeland Security and right. Government Coordination work, uh, but Secretary Duncan uh, from the Department of Education, because given the age group of the target population, uh, that has been a real effort. And he has regular calls, regular outreach with superintendents and principals and teachers um, all throughout. The CDC has specific guidance that's on the flu.gov website, at which we've asked schools to download and take a look at. And what happened to really change the school advice, the guidance that was out from uh, leaning toward closing schools to leaning toward keeping them open was first realizing that it would not present itself as a more lethal disease. Um, secondly, recognizing that there are a whole series of other health impacts for children who are sent home, um, missing often school breakfast and lunch, which has a nutritional impact, being Absolutely. in an unsafe environment, which has a significant impact if there's nobody home to take care of them. And on balance, uh, given the way the disease was presenting, it seemed uh, wiser that the guidance be toward keeping schools open, but trying to isolate and send home sick children, urging parents to keep them home in the first place. But if they show up at school, send them back home, isolate them until you can find a parent. Um, I think that this may change as we go along. And what we know is that what we saw this spring, there are going to be some areas of the country, some cities that have lots of cases, like New York. Uh, did in the spring. There are going to be others uh, relatively close by that may have very few cases. So it's impossible to have a national protocol yeah. and school decisions will continue to be very local. But that outreach we do in every two week call. We've had a big flu summit and ask governors to send in their education secretaries, their homeland security, their emergency planner, their health. So the school folks have been part of this conversation in a very robust way from day one. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. Madam Secretary, thank you for your service and thank you for coming here today and, and sharing with us on this. My name is John Barrow. I represent Savannah, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, and all points in between. Um, our prior response to seasonal flu might not be the best guide for what we should do. But it's probably a pretty good guide as to what we will do unless we do something different. <laughs> and I am given to understand that less than half the targeted populations we reach out to on a regular seasonal basis get the vaccine that is, that is, that is suited for, for that situation. And so we've got to anticipate, unless we do something different, we're going to have sort of a similar success rate in response to this, this new threat. Um, I understand that one of the targeted populations we are trying to reach in response to the H1N1 is um, the population of children and young adults six months to 24 years of age um, kind of sets it apart a little bit perhaps from seasonal flu. I'm having a, a telephone conference call this afternoon with a pretty influential bunch of folks um, with respect to that, that targeted population. My public health expert, Ms. Betty Dixon, is with me today and she's going to be participating in this conference. We're going to be talking with every superintendent, every assistant superintendent, the principals from every elementary, middle, and high school in the district, and the deans of students at many of the 18 institutions of higher learning uh, that we have in my district. So my question to you is sort of a general one, but what can we do, what can we say in the course of that conversation with that captive and very influential audience to help them get a higher success rate in reaching the targeted population they have some influence over than we've been able to do so far with respect to seasonal flu? What can we tell them that we're not already telling them? Well, I think that you can tell them that uh, we know that they have the target population and that um, if it's nothing more than just lots of folks getting the flu, that has a huge disruptive uh, factor. So having minimizing the spread right now and then vaccinating we know is the best defense against the flu spread. Uh, we do have some great information on the website. I would, I would suggest that maybe if you put the widget on your website and urge them to come and download, you know, we've got parent toolkits and information for teachers. This is how to. What can we tell them as to why to? This okay. is how to do things. What can we tell them to motivate them to make a greater effort than has been made in the past? Well, 
they can keep people from being hospitalized and dying. Um, if 36,000 children in this country die from this flu, I would suggest it will have a huge impact on communities around the country, and that is the average death rate for seasonal flu. So even if it is just like regular flu, given the population that basically they are responsible for, that is what it looks like. And so I think you need to convince them that even the regular flu is particularly uh, is different because it is kids and it's young adults, they have no immunity to this whatsoever. So anybody with underlying health conditions is really at far higher risk. And I think, I think just getting them their hands around 200,000 hospitalizations year in, year out with seasonal flu, 36,000 deaths, that's what the profile looks like. But typically because of the age of the population who is typically affected and because of their frail condition, I'm not sure it has the kind of societal impact, community impact. Um, there is, a, Dr. Shuka tells me, a new toolkit for school immunization that will be online, well, that went online on the 13th. Um, Available at? But I, I just think, you know, getting their attention about how even mild flu is very serious. People die, people get very sick, and anything we can do to prevent that, um, really, we need them to do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pitts is now recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, what uh, geographic regions of the country uh, does HHS expect to be hit the hardest by the H1N1 strain uh, during the winter flu season. Is there any projections that uh, your department has made? It seems like uh, the South has uh, reported an increase in cases. That might be just because they start school earlier in the South. I don't know. Do you have any uh, ideas on that? We, we really, um, Congressman, saw very scattered cases uh, throughout the um, country over the uh, spring during the outbreak, it, there was no one region, one area isolated. We think that the rise in cases in the southeast, which showed up first, is because of the fact that they did start school earlier and kids came together earlier. We're starting to see cases, though, spread. You know, Oregon, Kansas. I mean, so it's it's beginning to spread out as people come back to school, as colleges reengage. So we don't have any. Um, any information that gives us kind of a regional or local look at what's likely to be more of an outbreak, which is why it's so important that we keep watching it very closely and monitoring what's happening on the local level. Have um, all of the states uh, implemented what you would consider adequate uh, state preparedness plans for this? Well, Congressman, all states were required in order to access the funding available to help them implement, they were all required to submit plans. Um, I think that the assessment was that many states are, are ready in a very robust way. Others were in okay shape and some really needed a lot of help. We provided technical assistance, support, on the ground surveil. We also had teams that did site visits to try and verify that what was coming in in the written plan was actually accurate in terms of what was available. So we're trying to provide resources, help, support, and get states uh, ready to go because a lot of this will have to be, the shots in the arm are really going to be a, a state and local effort. Will there be enough vaccine uh, for all of the states to have? Yes. There, and are they adequately stockpiled now? Well, the vaccine isn't stockpiled because it hasn't been produced. Um, so that the vaccine, we hope, will um, begin to be widely available on the 15th of October, which is a target date. We anticipate having some early supplies uh, as early as 10 days before that, and it will be distributed as soon as it comes off the, off the production lines. Okay. My time is up. Thank you. Gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshu. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It's wonderful to see you. And uh, I want to salute you for your very steady, strong, sensible leadership. Whether you're testifying here or 
I see and hear you on whatever um, uh, 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 TV program. I, I, I think that um, uh, you speak very clearly uh, to the American people, and um, uh, I think that we all appreciate that. Um, there are, what, five companies that uh, are making the um, responsible for the um, five manufacturers. Uh, 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 making the uh, the vaccine. Uh, one of them is uh, Metamune, and uh, they are in my congressional district. Um, theirs is a is a nasal um, uh, uh, spray, uh, while the others are uh, the traditional uh, injections. What I'd like to know is: is this something that would be better used for children? D are, are you going to make a choice? Uh, to, uh, uh, relative to that, does it really matter? Uh, is it good for adults? Is it as good for children? And uh, how do you think that it might affect the voluntary um, uh, compliance rate uh, for those opting to get the H1N1 vaccine? And what I'm going to do, since we only can have one question, is to follow up on some funding uh, uh, questions relative to this whole thing. But uh, I'll just stick with that for now. What um, Dr. Shuckett tells me is that um, it isn't uh, the nasal mist is not recommended for the youngest children. So oh, it's not. Two uh -huh. to forty-nine seems to be the target population. I see. As long as they don't have underlying health conditions. Mm -hmm. So um, again, some of the highest risk children would not be recommended to get mm -hmm. the nasal mist instead. But it it certainly is a viable alternative for a lot of the population. Good. Well, thank you again for what I think is really special and highly needed leadership. We're proud of you. Thank, thank you. you. Gentleman from Merrill, uh, Mr. Shimkus, for questioning. Yes, I just want to, again, I was here for some of the opening statements. Welcome, uh, Madam Secretary here. Um, education, education, education is a key, uh, especially for a couple things, obviously just um, you know, passing of uh, the uh, flu, the germs, and all this other stuff. But also, I, we already have a run on hospitals and emergency rooms with people who you know, are, in essence, just having the everyday flu-like concerns. And I know that we have to do a good job calming the public so that they they use the services when they're needed, but don't overutilize them when they're not. And I don't know how you, I'm not, I'm not a health practitioner, or not, so I don't know how you gauge that, but I do think that uh, education is a key, is a key and, and I would agree with uh, my, my friend Anna Eshu, the calming presence that, uh, that your position is going to be required to hold, especially as we come into the this season of the year, I have three small, well, they're not small, I have a junior, a, a freshman, and a fourth grader. So uh, we're all concerned about, targets. yeah, we're all concerned when they start closing down schools and maybe before they should or, and so I would just want to encourage you. I don't have any answers. I'd like to yield the rest of my time to uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. I just had a follow-up question that came up. Uh, one of the questions down here was on the funding issue and there was, a little over seven and a half billion dollars uh, for the uh, H1N1 flu in the stimulus bill. Is that correct? That is correct. So, um, have these funds been dispersed? Are they readily available to you, or are they still being held somewhere in the stimulus pot? Or, what uh, do you have? All of the money you need? Do you have the funding that you need at this point? Um, at this point, Congressman, we do. Um, we are drawing that money down. We've made a couple of uh, drawdowns to buy vaccine and, and get ready to distribute it now that we have a little more clinical data. Uh, we're likely to have a more accurate picture of how much vaccine we're going to need. Um, we're, we've used some of it to replenish the stockpiles of antivirals that we sent to the states. Uh, to help, uh, as I say, about a billion four so far has gone out to states and hospitals for surge capacity. Uh, we're buying protective equipment, so we're, we're trying to uh, do a step at a time. And at this point, the funding provided is extraordinarily helpful. And we, um, So know, at the present time, you don't, don't anticipate having ad additional funding requirements that we'll be asked to, uh, to deal with? At this point, I, I don't have them. Again, we are watching this very closely. If, if this 
turns um, more lethal if it begins to present itself in a different way, if, uh, you know, things change and the surge capacity is wrong. At this point, I think we're on target, but it's a day-by-day -day operation. And let me just ask you one other follow-up uh, for Mr. Walden. He, of course, alluded to the fact that we've got, uh, and this is off the subject of the avian flu, but it's so important because in three months' time, cardiologists, oncologists, and indeed all, all physicians who practice under the Medicare system are going to receive a 21% a reduction if Congress doesn't do something. Now, we still have a vacancy at the head of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Is that not correct? That is correct currently. Yeah. How, how close are we to filling that position? We hope very close. This is a, a critical issue, and I would encourage you to, to get that done. And again, Congress has an obligation to its provider community to, to step up and do the right thing as far as the, the sustainable growth rate formula, but it's very, very difficult to even get an answer out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services right now without, a, without anyone at the helm. We do have, um, as you probably know, Congressman, a, a you probably know, Congressman, a, a new leader for the Medicare and a new leader for Medicaid who are in place, uh, John Blum and Cindy Mann, and um, they are doing a spectacular job. But I share your concern about the leadership, and we are very close. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Sarbanes from Maryland for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks so much for spending all this time with us. You're close to the end here. Um, I know we're all um, very grateful that you're in this position at this time because you've handled things so superbly and I think with a sense of calm that is contagious in a good way. So just don't get the flu. <laughs> um, well, maybe I can walk people through it a step at a time. Right, exactly. I think you answered the first question I was going to ask, which is the lethality, the, the judgment about how lethal this thing can be could change. I know that initially there was concern that it might be more lethal than it's turned out to be, but you just alluded to the fact that it could it could turn back in the other uh, direction. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And I was just curious, um, I imagine you have ways of judging the success of our overall effort to contain this uh, pandemic as we go forward, which would include clearly looking at the number of lives lost in the process. Um, I would imagine how well we're doing addressing these high-risk groups out of the gate, um, what's happening with particular communities in terms of the modeling that, that that suggests. I wonder if you could just point to any other sort of prime indicators you're going to be looking at and, and also comment on whether you anticipate that there will be kind of pivot points along the way where, we'll, where we may need to regroup um, and move in a, in a kind of different direction than we're anticipating right now? Um, great questions. I think that um, one of the lessons learned from the 76 experts was that there do need to be points along the way that you make sure we're still on track because, um, as people keep telling me, the uh, predictable um, fact about the flu is it's unpredictable. Um, it could change. So monitoring very closely what we're seeing. And part of the lethality is really watching what happens when uh, H1N1 begins to mix with the seasonal flu viruses. What we saw in the southern hemisphere is still encouraging, that it did not mutate into a significantly more dangerous virus. That's good news. But can that happen next month, the following month? You bet. So there, there will be continued monitoring and testing, particularly the more serious cases when they come to the hospital, uh, and making sure that we know that we're on target. Um, the vaccine seems to be exactly what it should be to target H1N1. The robust response is great. The um, limited time that it's taking is very good, and the fact that one dose seems to actually produce a, a good immunity response. All of that is very good news. But um, I think watching the outbreak, certainly monitoring very carefully hospital capacity, uh, how to deal with the more seriously ill folks. We really worry about, right now, antiviral um, treatments. Uh, we are unfortunately seeing um, many providers um, give antivirals prophylactically, so suggesting that people would fill a prescription and take it to prevent the flu. Um, what our scientists tell us is exactly 
that's the wrong direction because it actually lowers people's immune response. Uh, it could make them far sicker in the long run, and it'll draw down our antiviral stockpile. So that is a particular concern that we, we put out new antiviral guidance. We're doing some aggressive outreach to the provider communities, trying to remind them that that really is a strategy which is very counterproductive uh, in the long run. So I don't know what's the next challenge like that, but we'll have them. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, do you have any issues as far as prioritization geographically or otherwise when we have a vaccine become available? Could you identify any of those issues that that the public may be interested in or we may be interested in? <laughs> well, there's certainly no geographic priority. We've asked the states to present plans, which they have, and the um, Committee on Immunizations, I mean, the Committee on Immunizations has developed a priority list based on the science, basically five categories of people who um, total about 160 million Americans, uh, pregnant women, mm -hmm. uh, caregivers of infants under the age of six months, um, children six months to 24, particularly those with underlying health conditions, uh, adults 24 and up with underlying health conditions and health care workers. That's about 160 million people. We said to states, figure out how to get those folks to the front of the line. Uh, what are the best outreach opportunities? And that's where the vaccine will flow. There will be about 90,000 sites that will receive vaccine based on the state plans that we have. So we're not targeting, fo we're not making, we're just trying to use our bully pulpit in the communication to say to those target populations, you really need to think about this. And one of the challenges, as you all know, will be to get parents ready to sign consent forms for kids. So information is going home uh, in schools to say to parents, this will be available, we think, by the middle of October, but here's what the consent form is going to look like. You know, think about it, get ready to sign it. So if we have a vaccination effort at your school, your child actually could be vaccinated. I heard a, to me, sort of surprising comment by an ER room doc last week when I was home suggesting that one of the problems may be overutilization of our ER room services associated with this, that they're concerned about people coming in. The worried well. The worried well. And we understand worried. We'd all like to be well. You know, just to the extent we disseminate information, what would you tell us all? And you may have already talked about this, but it bears repeating, I think. In that regard, when when should people really feel compelled to you know go into the R room as opposed to calling your physician first or nurse? Well, I would even back it up a step uh, that if um, if someone comes down with the flu, either an adult or a child, and there are no um, serious consequences more than a fever and you know aches and pains, go to bed, chicken soup stay away from other folks. I'm not sure you need to take additional steps. Anyone with underlying health conditions, uh, asthma, diabetes, uh, neuromuscular disorders, should contact a physician on pre presentation of flu-like symptoms. That's the population uh, for antivirals. That's who needs Tamiflu fairly quickly or Relenza. Um, that's and then certainly anybody who then is more seriously ill or a child who becomes lethargic or, you know, there are a series of, again, tips on the website, you know, you take the next step. But it's really a triage. People who just come down with the flu probably don't need to call a doctor or have an antiviral or certainly not go to the hospital. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you very much. Uh, Turn it, we'll now recognize herself for the, oh, I think the last questioning. Um, and, and I want to thank you, Madam Secretary, and, and also the CDC staff, uh, again, for the remarkable job all of you have done in getting the information out, in, in tamping down panic. I, I, th I, think, I think that the, the uh, public health effort is going really well here. Um, I, I, uh, several times in your testimony, you, you referred to the concern that we have that that um, this virus could mutate, uh, we hope that it won't. It didn't in the southern hemisphere, but 
Um, we've had a number of hearings in this committee over the years about, about various flu strains. And of course, um, the avian flu has been a big concern of this committee over the years. I'm wondering, uh, first of all, how are we coming in developing an, a cell-based vaccine rather than the um, traditional egg-based vaccine that we're still uh, using for development of the H1N1 vi um, vaccine? My understanding, Congresswoman, is we're still a couple of years away from the different technology. Um, Cell-based, I think, is the um, sort of high-tech version. Actually, tobacco uh, growing is, is um, also regarded as pe by folks as sort of promising, but we are not close to, um, I mean, the last time I talked to folks, it's probably still a couple of years away. Are we, are, but are we making a, uh, a real effort towards these other, other vaccines? Because part of the problem we have, and, and part of our concern last, last spring with H1N1, was that we might not be able to identify the strain quickly enough to make a vaccination because we do have to produce the eggs. Well, that, um, I, what, the in, investing in developing a faster, um, uh, newer technology is still very much underway. It's part of what we're doing on an ongoing basis. So we're trying to accelerate the work, but um, it's not imminent that we will have another methodology for developing a vaccine than the egg-based method. I, 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 think, I think you can expect more hearings on this topic, and we're going to also ask right. some of the experts from I, NIH. I was going to say I would welcome the yeah. scientists. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, because, because what could happen is if we have a if we have a um, avian flu or some other kind of epidemic that is as that is as um, um, fast moving as right. this H1N1, right. then we would have really been in a trouble. Well, I think you're yeah. absolutely right, and I think this is a um, you know a, hopefully it won't be more than this, but a, a sort of wake up call right. that up till now it's been hypothetical. It's now very real, and we're watching a disease spread enormously quickly. Not only in this country, but it's now presented in about 120 countries around the world. So uh, we know this is real. And right. And with great rapidity. Um, what are we doing for people who are allergic to the egg-based vaccines with the H1N1 vaccine? Can they just not get it? Um, I was just told they cannot get it, but vaccinating those around them is the best Will way help. to protect. Okay. Um, now, uh, what is the status right now of H5N1, the avian flu vaccine? I mean, the avian flu virus. Is it, is, is it still lurking out there in parts of the world? It's still there. It's continuing to cause disease, but it isn't being transmitted very it's, easily. It's not as transmissible. Okay, I have a last question. Ms. Castor has the 9 and 10-year-olds at home. I have the college student. And the college students now, this is like when our kids were little and we had the um, chicken pox parties. The college students are now having flu parties where they're trying to purposefully get, I don't want to know exactly how they're, Trying to share the virus, but Police they are easing on each other. And, and she and um, and uh, so sh she and her friends asked me to ask you, what is your advice about this practice of these flu parties? Um, I would say it's a pretty bad idea. Um, that was my motherly advice too. So I just want to know from the <laughs> and I'm experts. I'm sure they won't listen any more to me than to you. But um, again, this is a serious disease. Um, most people. You know, getting the flu is is a problem. You miss work. You miss, but for a lot of people, this is deadly. And so, doing anything to transmit the disease, and particularly, I would say to um, our young and people who think they're invincible, um, a number of the younger folks may have health conditions that they're not even aware of, right. and they really could uh, be in serious trouble. Uh, by voluntarily getting this flu, so 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 I mean, in all seriousness, the 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 advice of the CDC and and everybody else is that for everyone, they should be taking hand washing protocols, doing their best if they feel sick to isolate themselves it, from others and absolutely. to keep this from spreading. And six to twenty four year olds, including the college age group, are in the 
first priority to get vaccinated. I mean, that's the best way on a college campus in a dorm to keep kids safe. We've done a lot of outreach to college presidents to say, you know, find a dorm or find an isolation room. You can't often send kids who are away from school home, but isolating them from one another. Don't have them go to the school cafeteria to get meals, figure out a way to get the meals, keep them away from roommates, um, because it really, what we know is this, this spreads very, very rapidly. And, and when the vaccine does come out, the college students should all go get vaccinated, correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've ended and under time, and uh, we're very appreciative of your testimony today. We'll look forward to seeing you again Glad soon. Glad to be here. Thanks. Hearing is adjourned. Before I adjourn the hearing, let me say the record will stay open for seven days for members to submit additional questions. Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius announcing at this hearing the FDA's approval today of a new swine flu vaccine, and she says she hopes to get the first limited supplies distributed in early October. If you missed the hearing, you can see it online at cspan.org. President Obama stopped in Pittsburgh to address the AFL-CIO convention today to talk about health care. The Associated Press reports he challenged members of the country's largest labor federation to stand with him and push ahead on a proposed overhaul of the health care system. And back here in Washington, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke says the worst recession since the 1930s is probably over. He says the economy is likely growing now, but he warned that it won't be sufficient to prevent the unemployment rate, now at a 26-year high of 9.7 percent, from rising. You can see Chairman Bernanke's comments online at cspan.org. Next month, a unique look at our nation's highest court, its role, traditions, and history. I don't think it's an understatement to say that this building would not be here.